everything was better in the good old days. So why am I saying this? I'm, I'm close to uh, turning 40 years old, and once you read a certain age, you, you start looking back at your life and thinking about how everything was better in, in the good old days, uh, right? So is this the same for, for software delivery? Um, I'm not sure. Let's get to, to know each other a, a bit, little bit better first. So can you all please stand up? It's a good exercise in, in you know, stretching your legs a little. Not going to make you do anything, anything stretch. Um, can you uh, uh, sit down if you have less than one year or no, or no experience in software development? So if you have one year or more experience in software development, please keep standing. Okay, pretty much everyone. If you have three years or more experience, keep standing. Otherwise, please sit down. Okay, five years? Ten years or more? Fifteen years or more? Okay, so we can probably talk together about the good old days, uh, right? <laughs> So you're free to sit. Uh, you're free to sit uh, now. Uh, so, so I would I would argue that um, software delivery uh, has become better, better over time, because in the old days there was lots of stuff to do uh, manually, and and if you needed to run an application, you needed to buy a server and and screw it in a rack somewhere. Uh, and there were, there were there was no cloud, and and there were no build servers. So one of my earliest uh, jobs, I was working on a company where we were developing software for insurance companies, and uh, at the end of the week, we would need to integrate uh, our software. So at the end of the week, everybody would gather around in the central place in the office, and there it was, it had its own table, it had its own chair, it was the integration laptop. So we'd go to the integration laptop and copy the software from our laptops over zip drive to the integration laptop, and then manually integrate this all, and then obviously there were merge conflicts and, and whatnot, and it took us about the whole day to, to get the application working to some extent. Then we would burn it on a CD and someone would get on his bicycle and go to the customer and deliver the software. If you look at what we're doing now with automated builds and, and uh, automated deployment, I would say that software delivery is getting better over time. So you're in a good profession. So my name is Bertjan Schrijver. I work at Open Value in the Netherlands. Uh, I also run the NLJUG Netherlands user group. Any NLJUG members in here? Okay, right in the front row, very well. So for the next uh, 50 minutes, uh, I'm going to dive into the principles of continuous delivery and DevOps uh, with you. So I'll start with a couple of definitions to uh, make each other all start on the same page. Uh, I'll share the goal, the ultimate goal of continuous delivery. Uh, I'll share the principles and the ingredients, kind of what, what you need to do for continuous delivery. Uh, I'll compare it to DevOps. Um, I'll hopefully convince you why you should do CD. I'll tell you where to start. Uh, and if you have time, depends on how much stories I, I, I tell. And if, you, if you're following me, uh, laughing helps. That, that makes me go deeper into stories. Uh, maybe we should uh, share some, some patterns and anti-patterns of continuous delivery and DevOps. And every story needs to end with a conclusion, and uh, this story is no different. So let's start with definitions. Um, I think it all starts with continuous integration. So how many of you are doing continuous integration? Okay, please keep, keep your hand raised. This is the last assignment you're getting from me, I, I think. Um, put your hands down if not all the developers in your team commit to the main line of your code, so the master or the trunk, at least once a day. Okay. Put your hands down unless every check-in triggers a build and a unit test run. Okay. And put your hands down if the build isn't fixed within 10 minutes when it breaks. One and a half, two, three, four, okay. So my point is, uh, a minute ago, everybody was doing CI and now only three people, so definitions matter. So, so uh, my point about CI is that team members integrate their work frequently, so you see your code colliding with, with somebody else's code, and uh, codes, uh, commits are, are verified by an automated build and test. And then kind of next step was continuous delivery. So what is, what is continuous delivery? I like to define it as a uh, way of developing and testing software in, in such a way that your software is always in a releasable state. 
So you're always ready to deploy your software to production. You don't necessarily do it, but you're, you're focusing on building and testing your software in such a way that it's always ready. I see some people taking pictures. That's fine. Uh, I'll, I'll share the slides afterwards uh, on, my, on my Twitter account, so uh, feel free to grab them there. Uh, and then it's continuous deployment. Uh, and that's basically <coughs> combining uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery and actually putting every change that gets verified by the automated pipeline uh, in production automatically. So every commit you do, if the tests uh, uh, think that it's good, it gets deployed into production. So is continuous deployment for everyone? I wouldn't necessarily say so. The most projects I do, the teams deploy to production after every sprint, so every two weeks or so. Um, is continuous deployment the ultimate goal? I wouldn't necessarily say so. Uh, if you're like in a real competitive battle with, with, a, with a competitor, uh, and it really matters getting your features out there one minute earlier than the competitor, okay, then, then it will work. Another advantage of continuous deployment is that you're doing lots and lots and lots of small releases. So if you're doing like one big release uh, uh, every half year, and there's something wrong after the release, you need to go to six months of changes. If you're deploying every commit individually to production and something goes wrong, it's pretty sure that the problem is in the previous commit. So it helps you in minimizing risk and also getting good insights in which changes are causing which behavior in production. And then my favorite, DevOps. I typically, um, uh, whenever I talk to somebody at DevOps, about DevOps, we, uh, can have this conversation. So we're talking about the same thing, but do we mean the same, and, and, and what does it mean, and DevOps is a hard thing to define. So I like to define DevOps as uh, more of a cultural thing. So it's development engineers and operations engineers being responsible together for, for a shared goal, being responsible together for the entire life cycle of a product. Uh, being responsible together for doing everything that's necessary to go from an idea in your head to working software in production. So how, how did continuous delivery start? Uh, it mainly started with this. It's a book from 2010. It has 450 pages and it was written by, who knows who wrote this book? Jess yes, Humble, that's one. And Dave Farley, yeah. And this book describes in pretty much detailed steps uh, about uh, how Jess and Dave uh, uh, describe continuous delivery. And it's a, it's a good book, and I'd say it's still fairly current, even though it's almost 10 years old. So what, what is uh, continuous delivery trying to reach? Continuous delivery is about defining a uh, repeatable and reliable process for releasing software. So it's about getting software out there to your end users in a reliable way and in a repeatable way. So what are the kind of the, the key principles? Uh, one obviously is about automation. If you automate something uh, and it's any good, then well, you got the repeatable step all right because re re repetition is kind of the goal of automation. Uh, and if you automate it right, then you will have the reliability also. It's about keeping everything in version control, because if you have it in version control, you can see who changed what and when, and it's easy to revert to earlier versions. If it hurts, do it more often, and also bring the pain forward. So if there's anything that, that is hurting you or stopping you from getting software out there to your end users, start practicing it, and start pulling it as far up front, or shifting left is also a term that's used, as far up front in your delivery process. If you have performance issues, uh, they can qu hurt quite a lot in production. If you notice a performance issue during development, it's fairly relatively easy to fix it. Quality is important. If you want to deliver working software to your end users every day, it better be good. Because if you want to be able to change software, it needs to be adaptable. Uh, it needs to uh, be maintainable. And done means released. So uh, um, you, cannot, you cannot say, I'm done with this feature once you've developed it on your local laptop. It isn't done until it's either running on a test environment for somebody to, or an acceptance environment for, for, for somebody to, to, to uh, evaluate it, or even better, until it's in the hands of your end users. So uh, it, the definition I typically use is done means it's either in production 
or it's going to production really soon and it's good enough to go to production. Another key ingredient is everybody in the team is responsible. So it's not just the, 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 the ops people or the release manager or, or the developers. Everybody should work to, to get great software out there to your users and work together. Testers can help here. The product owner can help in testing and evaluating. The project manager, well, maybe you can make a nice big button that the project manager can hit to deploy to production. Uh, I don't mind, but everybody should feel responsible for, for getting software out there. And you need to be able to, to focus on continuously wanting to improve yourself. So um, uh, evaluate how your, team, how your team is working, evaluate how your application is running in production, is there anything going wrong? What can we do to become even better at delivering, delivering software? So what are the ingredients of, of, uh, of continuous delivery? I say you can divide them in uh, five categories. So the first one is about a culture and organization. Uh, design and architecture, how you build stuff and how you deploy it to production, how you test stuff and how you verify that it's actually doing what it should be doing, and information and reporting, getting insights on, on how stuff is going. So we're going to dive in a bit more detail in these categories now. So talking about culture, um, I think agile software development is, an, is a key ingredient of, of, con of continuous delivery. Being able to work in short iterations, uh, try to get as much feedback as you can on your, um, on your software, and, and work in small steps and frequently deploy whatever you've done. Building the right thing, so focusing on getting stuff that matters out there to your end users. So typically what I like to do is there's one team, there's one prioritized backlog, there's one product owner, and you're working in small increments and having quick and, and, and short feedback loops. And then building the thing right, which basically means focusing on, on quality, on clean code, on software craftsmanship, and actively working on um, removing or preventing technical debt in your application. Because that's the only way you're gonna make it in the long run. You build it, you run it. It's a fairly famous statement from uh, Werner Vogels, the, the CTO of Amazon. And basically, what, what he means is, if you build something, you will also be responsible that the stuff you build is doing okay in production, that it's running fine. And this is, I think, one of the key values of DevOps. So, if I uh, build something, and um, somebody else is going to deploy this for me, and going to be responsible for this thing to run smoothly in production, and things explode in production, will I get called off my bed, out of my bed? No. The, the uh, operations person will, will get called out of bed. So do I feel the pain of my crap code? No. If I have a pager or a mobile phone on my nightstand next to my bed, and I'm working in the afternoon, building somewhere that something is going to deploy in production, and I have any doubts that this is going to explode at night, and I get woken up, I better make sure that this code is, 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 is pretty good. So I think you should also like feel responsibility and feel the pain of, of actually running your code in production for your end users. Cross-functional teams. Um, I think I said it before, and probably will say it about 20 times again, uh, but ideally a team has all the capabilities it needs to go from an idea in your head to working software in production. So design, development, testing, releasing it, deploying it, maintaining it, supporting it, debugging it. And make sure there's room to experiment and, and room, room for failure. Because experimentation gives you insights that you cannot get by thinking. Um, failure is, is the only place where you learn. So I typically have discussions like with, with uh, customers like, you know, we're working agile and we have like self-supporting self teams. Uh, so what is the role of the project manager in this situation? Uh, so then I typically uh, say, uh, the, the role of the project manager is to make sure that, that the team is working in an environment where it's okay to fail, where the team is okay with, with failure to happen, because, because that's where you learn. So dive into design and architecture a little. Uh, obviously version control. Everything that's in version control is something that you can uh, uh, roll back when something is wrong and you can see who changed what when. Modularity, being able to work independently on different parts of your application because this helps in kind of wrapping your head around the thing you're working on at the moment. Branching strategy, so I'm not going to 
uh, burn, burn my fingers on which branding, branching strategy is right, but make sure that you have one. Either you do trunk-based development, or you work with feature branches, or you work with uh, Gitflow. I, I don't know, just pick something that works, but make sure that the team agrees on this. Have some way to handle database changes. And I would argue that this is one of the hardest problems. It's easy to, to deploy just a binary artifact to production that is an application, whether it's a jar or a doc container. If something is wrong, you just install a previous version. Database work a bit differently. So make sure that you have a strategy how you cope with database changes in a, uh, accordance to uh, releases of your application. So either use something uh, like Flyway or Liquibase to automatically handle migrations or work with backwards compatible database changes. But, but, but think about if I make this database change now and I want to revert it later, what do I need to do to do this? If the answer is, I don't know, or the answer is restore a backup that takes 10 days to restore, okay, maybe think about, think about your strategy again. Design for failure. So think about if I'm going to run the software in production, which can, what can go wrong? And if things go wrong, how will my application respond to this? Especially when you're building distributed systems, there's the, the, the fallacies of distributed, distributed computing, like the network has uh, no latency. Uh, all, all this stuff that, 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 that can go wrong, think about timeouts. If you're calling external server, will you get a timeout? And if there's a timeout, will requests pile up in your application? Uh, if your application is under uh, heavy load, how will it respond? Can you, can you scale? If, if an application crashes, will it automatically be restarted? So think about all the things that can go wrong and design your application to handle this in, in the most graceful way. Feature toggles are a nice way to um, uh, disconnect uh, deploy the moment of deployment from the moment of release. So sometimes you're working on a feature that takes longer than one sprint to develop. Uh, so will you keep this on your own computer or in a different branch for a couple of weeks? Uh, well, I'd say CD is about integrating work, work frequently. So um, my preference is to commit it to your mainline of your code anyway, but use a feature toggle to shut this code off. So basically an if statement around the feature that you're building. And with web applications, um, it's prob probably fairly easy to to deploy a new version where this feature is enabled or disabled. But think about mobile applications. You're building an iOS application or an Android application. And in order to get a new release out to your end users, it will take one week of being uh, getting uh, OK from the App Store and having your users install it. If you, if you release a feature that breaks stuff, can you wait a week for your users to get the fix? Probably not. So what you can do is um, uh, guard every feature you're building with a feature toggle and have this be configurable in some way. Maybe it be a general switch every time the application starts up, it, it reads the switch or something else. And then you can uh, enable this feature once enough users have installed the app. And if you see it doesn't work, switch it off again. You maybe can switch on separate features for specific user agents or specific devices or specific users. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in, in disconnecting the moment of getting a feature to the end users from the moment of deploying it to production. And think about automated provisioning. So if you, ha if, if you have an application running in production, and uh, let's say that the server you're running on was, um, uh, was configured by Joe, and uh, then uh, something happens, the data center burns down, uh, and Joe isn't working for the company anymore, and nobody knows how the server was configured. You got a challenge. Well, if you automate your provisioning, if you use, I don't know, uh, pre-built dog containers or Puppet or uh, uh, Ansible or whatever, then the configuration of your server is stored in your automation scripts in version control. So if you automate provisioning of your environments, you also avoid problems like, oh yeah, but this setting on the production environment was just a bit different than the setting on the acceptance environment. So make sure that, that you, you have some way of having faith in that all your environments behave in the same way and that it's fairly easy to rebuild them. It's about building and deploying stuff. I think the key point of, one of the key points of, of uh, CD and basically about building and deploying are pipelines. So what is a pipeline? It's an automated way to get software from version control into the hands of your end users. And there are basically two types of pipelines. So there's a build pipeline, and this is what happens whenever you commit something, it gets built, tested, and then the result of the build pipeline is a deployable artifact. So it's something that you can deploy. It can be a jar, 
It can be a dock container, it can be a zip file, it's a front end project, whatever. So, so something that's, uh, that's, that, that's um, uh, a binary that you can deploy and that you will not ever change again. So typically for Java projects is a Jenkins pipeline that checks out code from, from your version control and then deploys a jar to Nexus or Artifactory or some artifact store. Then there's a deployment pipeline. And the deployment pipeline picks up where the build pipeline stops, so it picks up the release and it deploys the release to an environment. So typically the input for a deployment pipeline is an application, a version, and a target environment. And if you separate these two, then you will have the ability to deploy any version of your application to any environment at any time. If you would stick these two together and you would need to uh, revert to a previous version of your application, then maybe you need to run the build pipeline again. Maybe something changed in the environment and you're not exactly producing the same artifact anymore. So I, uh, what I typically try to do is um, the result of the build pipeline is an artifact, is a release, so a Maven release, and this doesn't ever change anymore. And this release is deployed to test, to acceptance, to production, uh, but you're not making any changes in between. Because if you're making separate builds for development and for acceptance and for production, then you're basically deploying an untested build to production. About testing. So make sure that you have some strategy of how you test things. There's a thousand ways to test things. You can have unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end -end tests, uh, UI uh, uh, tests, um, uh, REST or SOAP endpoint uh, tests. Make sure that you give it some thought about which parts of my application am I going to test in which way. For example, if you would choose to test your entire application only through UI tests, so firing up a browser, connecting to that browser and testing your application, then there's one thing that you can be sure of, that your test suite is going to take a long, a long time when your application grows. Well, as unit tests are something that are typically relatively easy to write and run really, really fast. So make sure there's a balance between the different types of tests that you have um, and uh, make sure that you can get uh, as much confidence as possible about your application in the shortest amount of time. Because, well, waiting is nobody's hobby. And obviously test automation is, is important. So it's not necessary to test your entire application automatically. Uh, if you want to do continuous deployment, it is necessary. If you um, uh, have some way of like uh, manual, uh, a manual okay of an environment before you deploy to production, this is okay if you, if you uh, deploy it like once every two weeks. So here you see two of our junior testers who have just uh, found an issue in uh, one of our applications. So let me tell you a story about automation. And it has probably nothing to do with software development, but a little bit about automation. So I have, I have two kids. They are five and seven uh, now. And uh, a while ago, I think there were one, one and three, I was at my parents-in-law's uh, house, and my son said, to Dad, I, I need to go to the toilet. And I'm like, OK, you go. And I'm thinking, wait, he's still wearing diapers. What does he do? Why does he want to go to the toilet? But fine, I thought I'd run off. And then my daughter runs, runs with him, go to the toilet, and I hear them chatting there, and like, oh, what is this, and this is nice, and I think, oh, wait, this takes a little bit too long, I better go watch what's, what's going on. So I walk in there, and I'm like, oh, yes, crap. My parents and all have this uh, modern toilet that has a system when if you press a button, things will happen. So it will start cleaning. Uh, and and um, um, my, actually, my, my daughter, it was my daughter. My daughter was sitting on the toilet, and my son is standing, standing next to her. And uh, I see him looking at the button with the flashing light that activates the system. And we were just training my daughter to go to the toilet then, so I was like, okay, this should not become an unpleasant experience for her. So she was sitting there, and my son was gradually moving closer to the blinking button. And obviously, I know what he's going to do, because I would do exactly the same. So he's slowly moving while, while looking at me in, in the, you know, uh, smiling, like, I'm not going to do anything. Okay, fine. And he's moving closer. So I'm like, Pim, his name is Pim. I'm like, Pim, you're not going to touch that button, are you? Okay, that was probably the, the dumbest thing to say. Because if you say a one-year-old do not do something, he does it. So he moves closer. I said, Pim, do not touch the button. He moves closer. I said, Pim, do not touch the button or you'll be in trouble. He looks me straight into the eyes, 
I see a sparkle in his eye, and obviously he presses the button. So there I'm standing in, in, in the entrance of the toilet. He's standing there next to the toilet. My daughter is sitting, and, 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 and from the side of my eye, I see this, this water jet like sliding out of the toilet towards my daughter. And I think if this thing goes off, then we're, we're, we're back to start, and she's not going to go on the toilet for the next 34 years of her life, probably. So what do I need to do? I only have one, one option, to, to save her. So I, 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 I reach out, and I lift her from the toilet. At that moment, <laughs> I get cleaned. <laughs> so the good thing was it was warm, so that was nice, uh, but still I was going wet. So, so then what happens is I'm standing there. My, my, my son, uh, he, he got scared because of things happening. My daughter was screaming because I'm holding her up, and water is going in my face. I'm all wet. So what's the moral of the story? Uh, automation is only as good as its ability to cope with the unexpected. So this, this machine was not designed to uh, go off with not somebody, somebody sitting on it. So if I were to design a machine, uh, I would only activate like, the, the, the flow of water when there was a behind above it, if you catch my, catch my drift. So if, if you're working with automation, always think about what, what stuff that can go wrong, what, 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 what stuff can go wrong, what can happen. So another example is I was working at a, well, the insurance uh, company, actually, and we needed to drop a database uh, for, uh, to, to clean, I think it was a postal code table or something. We need to drop it. And there's this guy uh, from the hosting party, and he's like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in a train, but I've scheduled it. That's where I should have thought, what does he mean by I've scheduled it? Okay. Database is empty, timer is on a year later, and as it later turned out, exactly a year later, client calls. We have a production issue. Okay, what's going on? We cannot make any new policies or quotes on the system. Okay, that's pretty serious because that's your way of making money. So why, why can't you do this? The system cannot find any postal codes. Okay, strange. Let's investigate. Did the hosting party do anything? Did we do anything? No. Okay. About 20 minutes later, we decide to fetch the logs from the database. We get the logs from the database, going through it. That's interesting, there's a truncate statement in the logs. Okay, strange. So, what's going on? Don't know. Okay, so we, we run the batch up again to, to fill the database, and then the, 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 the company is back in business. But how did this happen? So they start investigating, We're like, are there any scheduled jobs or something? No, no, nothing. Just this cron string that is calling special.sh. <laughs> and special.sh was the thing that was scheduled by uh, the guy from the train uh, a year before. And he wanted to make it really specific, so he set it to the day of the month, the day of the week, the hour, the second, and you, you can't set years, I think, in cron statements. So exactly a year later, the database was truncated. So think about automation and think about consequences of what you're doing. And then there's non-functional requirements. And non-functional requirements are basically requirements that if you do not meet them, they make the system non-functional. So probably a load test would have helped here, I, uh, would, I would say. Uh, security. So find a way to, to integrate security and, and security reviews and maybe automate security scanning in your delivery process. Because if you're only doing like a pen test one, once a year, uh, then you only know that you're okay or not once a year, and lots of things can happen within that year. And obviously performance. So find a way to incorporate performance testing in your delivery cycle, preferably by, by integrating performance testing in your, uh, your, your builds or, or in your deployments and doing it during your sprints to get some insights of other things that I'm doing, uh, having a positive, uh, a zero, or a negative impact on my performance. And then this one is a bit harder to automate, but find a way to verify that what you are doing is actually delivering the correct business value. Ask your end users, ask your product owner, is this feature working out? Did we build it correctly? Does it help you make your work easier? I learned once that when I wanted to remove the print button from an application, uh, the client said, no, no, absolutely do not remove the print button. It's vital for us. So we're like, why? If you, you go to this, uh, this wizard and then you press send and it gets ultimately transferred and again in an export and then this export is read by your mainframe and then you're all, it's all straight to processing. And I said, yeah, except for one thing. We never, we never built the imports in our mainframe 
because it was too hard for us. So everybody prints, prints the quote, and then goes to like the, the department that handles this, puts it on a desk, and then they continue from there. And a bit about information and reporting. So make sure that you have some way of statically analyzing your code, be it through sonar or something else, to give you insights on how, how, is, the, how is the stuff that in my code that can actually be, be checked automatically. Uh, is this all right? Do you have any technical debt, possible bugs here? How's my test coverage co uh, coming along? Work on traceable pipelines, meaning that ideally you have a trace from requirement in your requirement system, be it Jira or something else, a user story, a commit in Git, a build, a, uh, and a deployment in production, so that you can really trace everything that's happening in your software delivery cycle. Who in here loves creating release notes out of Jira tickets or something else? Who thinks it's the best job in the world? Okay, we got, well, we got a couple. I'm happy for you. Uh, it's easier if you find a way to automate this. Find a way to automatically generate release notes. You can maybe do this from commits, that, but that will mean that your commits actually need to have meaningful text. That's an auto story. Or maybe from your bug tracker, or find a way to do this. Get metrics on how, how stuff is used. I sometimes have discussions about, about a feature, like uh, this feature is, is designed and built badly. I want to remove it from the system. Yeah, but it's a really important feature. So how, much time, how many times is it used? And if you know metrics, the discussion stops there. If you have metrics, you're saying this feature is only used every once in three months by you, the product owner, and no end users at all. So then you can safely remove it. Make sure that you have some, some way of, of um, your, your users or your team to create dashboards for themselves. Dashboards about maybe users' metrics, about metrics about how the system is running, about error levels, about response times. Uh, there, there are plenty of tools that can help you with this. And then this can help in turning your organization into a more data-driven organization that can make decisions based on data and on metrics and not based on feelings or hunches or ideas. And in the end, you get to the stage where you, you will notice problems because of your monitoring and your metrics before the users even notice. And then if you get called by the help desk as a problem, you can say, yeah, we're already working on this. We're already fixing this. It will be fixed in five minutes from now. And then there's DevOps. So what was first? Continuous delivery or DevOps? Who thinks continuous delivery was, well, uh, thought of first or coined first? Who of you thinks that DevOps was first? Who of you has no idea or didn't raise their hand? Okay, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're being honest. So DevOps was first presented in a, um, uh, a BOF session uh, in 2008 and was called Agile Infrastructure and was presented by uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer. And the session basically kept empty. Only one guy walked in, uh, Patrick Dubois, a Belgian guy. And uh, the discussion that, 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 that rose there basically was the, uh, the beginning of, uh, of defining DevOps. So actually DevOps was, was coined before continuous delivery. So what is DevOps? Uh, I'd say, well, I think I said it before, development operation engineers being responsible together for the entire life cycle of a product, so feeding responsibility. Another thing you could say was developers and other IT professionals uh, working together on a shared goal, and that shared goal is kick-ass software in production. So why should you do DevOps? Because it helps making your business win. So DevOps enables you to, to, to work on continuous delivery. DevOps helps you to re resolve problems faster and to focus on, on adding value instead of focus on, on fixing problems. So what is DevOps? Is it like, can you hire a DevOps? Can you become a DevOps? Can you buy DevOps? I would say this mostly about, about culture. So DevOps is about reinforcing culture with technology and vice versa. It's about collaboration, cooperation, and communication. And it's about being agile and, and continuously wanting to improve yourself. DevOps is about freedom. Freedom for teams to, to resolve stuff and build stuff in the way that they like. But there's one price you pay for freedom. The price you pay for freedom is responsibility. So take responsibility and, and trust your teammates and, and design a system in, in which people are held responsible for the consequences of their actions. 
So another system where you blame people, where you're just saying, okay, so this happened, how can we work on make this better next time? And, and create cross-functional teams for every product or service. You build it, you run it. And I think the, the most important ingredient of DevOps is empathy. So being able to, to put yourself in somebody else's place and feel like, how is this person experiencing what I'm saying? What's, what's happening now? And, and DevOps means gi giving enough about your job to want to learn all the parts and not just your own little world. So empathy allows you to, to, to view uh, other teams as enablers rather than as blockers. So be likable, be approachable, and get stuff done. I think that's basically the, the point of DevOps. So then what you typically hear is, uh, yes, it all sounds pretty good. And some of you are probably thinking, but it won't work here. Continuous delivery won't work here. And this is from a talk uh, by uh, Jess Humble, where he's explaining like a couple of arguments that people, people tell to him, like why they can't do continuous delivery. So Jess is saying, the reasons that, that people are stating that, that uh, continuous delivery won't work is, well, we're regulated, so we can't do CD. Okay, so how about Amazon? Amazon is regulated. Amazon is doing a gazillion deployments per day, probably, or maybe even two gazillion. We're not building websites. Okay, fair. So I'll tell you a little story about the HP team, who started doing continuous delivery for their laser jet firmware and automating deployments to test printers in their own house. We have too much legacy. Okay. There are people doing TDD on mainframes. Uh, there's the strangler pattern that you can use to kind of wrap, wrap your legacy application and then work with tests from the outside. Basically, you can test everything. Uh, some, some things are just harder to do. And this is my favorite one, or actually also my least favorite one. <laughs> Our people are too stupid to do continuous delivery. Come on. Well, the actual reasons are our culture stinks, or our architecture stinks. So let me tell you about culture. There was a car manufacturer called Nummi, and Nummi was part of General Motors, and it had a factory based in Fremont in California. And the management was not too well, and the workers were getting demotivated, and they were demotivated to the point where they were drinking <laughs> during production of cars, and they were putting empty Coke bottles in, in doors, so that he would like make a rambling noise when you would open and close them. So that was how bad it was. And then GM said, "This is not going to work. We need to uh, we need to shut down the factory because our people are too stupid to build good cars." And then um, uh, Toyota came in and Toyota partnered with GM, and Toyota went to set up a new factory in, in the same building. And then kind of like the um, um, the um, workers' organization uh, went talking with Toyota and said, "Like you need to hire these people again." So Toyota hired these people again, put them on training, uh, and really took well care of them, and they started building amazing, amazing cars. And then they, the, the manager from, from Nummi um, talked to the manager of Toyota, like, well, where, where did you get these, these amazing people? And he said, like, I, got them, I got them from you. So was the problem that the people were too stupid? Was the problem somewhere else? I know where it was, and it wasn't the people. So why, why should, you, should you do all this? It sounds pretty hard. Um, what will you get from this? It helps reducing errors. It helps lowering, lowering stress. Because if you know that you can deploy to production without any trouble and everything has been verified by an extensive test suite, you're good, right? It helps empowering teams with making decisions themselves and, and getting features out there to their end users without needing to wait on release managers or, or ops teams. It gives you flexibility in terms of deployment. You can deploy whatever you want, whenever you want to production, instead of waiting for, for release slots every X months. And practice really makes perfect. So uh, if you do things more often and you automate more often, then it, it helps you get better every day. And this typically makes people happier. So where do you start? Well, it's simple. You're just saying like, okay, let's spend a couple of months don't deliver any features anymore to production uh, and uh, just focus on automating our build and release infrastructure, redesigning everything, and let's continue building features in four months from now. And this is a famous quote from 
no product manager ever. Because you can't do this, right? You need to keep the shop open. You need to, to work on features uh, to keep providing business value for the people that are actually paying the team to provide business value. So how, how, how can you do this? I think the key is to, to start small. So pick one thing that you're pretty sure that you can improve. And then show what you've done. Like, okay, I've automated this little thing, and this saves us five minutes every time we do it. But we do it 20 times a week. And it was boring, and now it's automated. Share this with, with, with the team and, and with others and celebrate what you've done. Order a cake, but not too many, just, just maybe one. And then iterate from there. So take a look at what's the, what's the next thing we can do. And pick up this thing and, and start iterating there and, and keep improving. And you will see that in the beginning you will get resistance from people who are, I don't know, maybe scared about job security. But if you show like, look, I've done this and now we can automatically deploy this uh, here. Oh, wow, well, that's pretty cool. So now I have more time to work on monitoring or to upgrade into the latest version of Linux or, or you know, whatever. Make, make sure that, that you pick small things, share them, start to get people enthusiastic about what you're doing, and then iterate from there. So we have good news. <coughs> we have nine minutes left for me to check whether you've paid good attention in the past 40 minutes. So I'm going to share a couple of continuous delivery patterns and anti-patterns. I'm going to state something on the screen. Then I'm going to ask you whether you think this is a pattern, it's a good thing, or whether it's an anti-pattern, it's a bad thing that you shouldn't do. So I'm going to ask your cooperation here. The only thing you need to do is raise your hand when I'm, when I'm asking to, and maybe think a little. So the first thing, it's a great idea to do continuous delivery, but to not do DevOps. So do CD and stay with traditional operations. Who thinks this is a pattern? Okay, like this was the initial uh, when we testing question. Who thinks this is an anti-pattern? I agree. Make, let's make it a bit harder. Uniform build pipelines. So imagine you're a big company with 20 teams or 200 teams, and you have one team working on central build pipelines that every team can reuse. So the teams do not need to build their pipelines themselves. They can just reuse the generic build pipelines. Who thinks this is a pattern? OK, who thinks this is an anti-pattern? OK, what do I think? So yes, there's our, there's our good things and bad things about this. The good thing is that every team is ready to get started right away. The bad thing is that teams can differentiate in, in what types of pipelines they do. If one team wants to do something different, it might be hard for them. So, so one way to solve this is to create like a generic library of high-level steps, build and deploy an application, consists of lower-level steps, check out conversion control, uh, deploy to an environment, run the tests, and then teams can kind of cater to their own needs, like which, which part of the pipelines do I use. Long-running pipelines, pipelines that run for longer than, I don't know, let's say 30 minutes. Who thinks this is a, a pattern that you should do? Anti-pattern? Yeah, I think in general your consideration should be to make, make pipelines as short as possible because feedback, feedback loops matter, short feedback loops. If I do something that takes 10 minutes for me to, to get feedback, I've already forgotten what I was doing 10 minutes ago, I'm like a goldfish. Uh, so the, the, the faster you get feedback, the easier it is to, to stay in, in, in your thinking process and to, to improve and, and iterate. If you have an enormous application with three gazillion tests, uh, okay, then maybe your pipelines will run long, but still you should strive to make them as short as possible. Obsess on test automation. Should you be absolutely crazy about automating all your tests? Who thinks this is a pattern? Who thinks this is an anti-pattern? Yeah, I, was, I, I deliberately chose the wording so that it looks like a bad thing. I would say it's good. Uh, focus on, on creating a good automated test suite that gives you quickly gives you confidence about the quality of your application. Obsessing obviously is, is never good, but I try to, you know, try to uh, confuse you a little. So logging and metrics. Uh, how is production running? This is something that only operations would have access to. Who thinks this is a pattern? Anti-pattern? Okay, that was pretty easy, right? It's for everybody, because especially developers need to get insights on how is this feature that I built behaving in production. Obsess, that is again, obsess. Should you obsess on feedback loops? Get as much feedback you can as quickly as possible. Who thinks this is a pattern? Okay, who thinks this is an any pattern? Okay, well, I agree. Uh, so try to get feedback as quickly as possible, be it either automated, you push something, you get a re result from a build as quickly as possible. From your end users, hey, I've deployed this to production, can you tell me what you think about it? From your product owner, whatever, but 
try to get feedback. But feedback is the only, the only way that you're going to learn that you did well or not. Manual steps in a delivery pipeline. So for example, like a manual approval button or a manual button that waits like, can I start a performance test? Who think that this is a, a pattern, a good thing to do? Who thinks it's an anti-pattern? Yeah, I'd, I'd say kind of both. Like it's okay, uh, I, I wish to try to minimize and make everything as automated as possible. But sometimes maybe you have a pipeline that will deploy to your acceptance environment and then run the tests on the acceptance environment and if everything is okay, it will prompt you with a button like, is it okay to, to, deploy, to deploy to production now? Is this can help your, your management or product owner to get confidence and, and he or she really likes to press buttons? Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, I don't really see a problem in this, but if you can do it without pressing buttons, it's even better. Long living branches. So should you have branches that live longer than one sprint in your version control? Who thinks this is a pattern? Who thinks it's an anti-pattern? I agree, because if you have a branch, you're detached from whatever is happening on your main line of your code. You're not integrating your work. You're basically not even doing CI if you're running in a branch. Obviously, there's counter arguments like, but I'm merging the master branch in my branch every day. Okay, so why aren't you merging your branch into the master branch every day then? Because other people won't see your changes as long as it's in your own branch. Roll forward only deployments. So if you deploy something, um, you should never roll back to a previous version. But instead, always, if there's a problem, make sure that you're really, really quick in producing a new release and then rolling out this new release afterwards. Who thinks it's a good idea to do roll forward only deployments? Who thinks it's a bad idea to do this? Yeah, this, uh, maybe you could call this both a pattern and anti-pattern. I would say to strive for roll forward only deployments because let's say that you're deploying something that has 10 new features. After deploying it, you're noticing one feature is not okay. If you roll back to the previous version, you're removing nine good features from the hands of your end users which is a shame because you're removing good, good features from them. Uh, on the other hand, if this is a feature that's completely exploding your production environment and nobody can use anything, obviously do everything you can to, to go back to a working scenario as quickly as possible. But in general, if it can wait, if it's not a critical bug, if it's something you can fix in maybe an hour, let, let it be and then roll out a new version as quickly as possible afterwards. Putting everything on version control, code, infrastructure, database scripts. We think this is a great idea. Yes. Uh, it helps you seeing who did what when and to go back whenever necessary. Lots and lots and lots of small releases versus a couple of big releases. We think this is a good idea. Okay, you're getting there. Yes. Because lots of small releases means you're doing lots of low-risk deployments. And if something goes wrong, it's easy to spot the problem. TDD, test driven development, it's for software. You cannot do soft TDD on infrastructure. Who agrees with this? Who disagrees with this? Okay, so it's, it's, it's a bit harder, I, I'd say, because with infrastructure, you may need to validate that your provisioning scripts are actually building like a correctly working machine, but still. Dev plot parity, so um, uh, production and development should be exactly uh, the same, as, as, as uh, detailed as possible. Who thinks it's a good idea? Yes, I think too. Um, so you're lucky because we're going to skip over the next uh, ones. And let's uh, summarize. So to summarize, what is the goal of a software team? What is your, your bigger goal? What are you trying to reach when you're building software? I say your goal is to build working and useful software that's delivering value to your end users in production. And if you ask me, there's only one way to do this, and this is continuous delivery. So thanks a lot for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, afterwards. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, I will uh, post the slides uh, there for your enjoyment. Um, please, please, please do not forget to rate the session uh, in the DevOps app. Uh, be honest, but also be generous. And thanks a lot for your time.